You're listening to The Disconnect, a podcast about anxiety and how it disconnects you from your normal self. We're here to share our journey and help you through yours to show you you're not alone. And now, your hosts, Austin Grant and Lindsay Jones. Welcome to episode one, or I guess two really, since we played episode zero. Episode one slash two of The Disconnect. Um, in today's episode, we're going to be discussing what anxiety has looked like for us from a young age and how it has evolved as we've gotten older. As a general reminder, Austin and I are not medical professionals. As a disclaimer, nothing we say on the podcast should be taken as medical advice, and we always want to recommend seeking out professional medical help for any diagnosis or treatment. So we'd like to start with some background. Um, for me, I think looking back, my anxiety kind of started around the time that my grandfather died. I was in second grade, and I realized that people someday close to me would die and my second grade brain freaked out um, and then realized that someday my parents would die and we're going really dark here but my brother would die someday and that just stressed me out as what a about small the dogs child. oh yeah everybody dies it's all it's all one of those inevitable things we all have to be born and we have to die and everything in the middle we don't necessarily have to do it's how I it's how I live my life. I don't have to do anything except be born and die and I've already done fifty percent of that. Look at me, already succeeding. And you thought about all of that in second grade. Yes. I was a very odd second grader. I've always been ahead of the curve. But this was really my my first experience with death, and so I think that is probably what triggered it. I don't know if maybe in second grade I 100% understood what death meant, but what it ultimately meant was that I would never see my grandfather again, and I understood that part, um, and not understanding what that meant, like where he had gone, uh, was probably the part of that that freaked me out the most. Yeah, I think I, I started around the same time, too. I don't know if it was second grade exactly, per se, um, but definitely... After I moved to Yuma, so I don't know if that's any correlation. Um, but yeah, 115 degree weather will do something to you. But yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, I think it started kind of back around that time. Um, but you said for you, so that was the first time you'd ever experienced a death in your family, right? Yeah, that was the first time that I was old enough to comprehend it like my great-grandparents had passed away um but i was like two or three and that's not old enough to really understand like i have pictures of me at the funerals but i i have no me memory of that time when i was in second grade like i used to see my grandfather every day growing up and it was kind of a really big big life event to happen and I actually put was put into counseling for the first time I had to see the school counselor because I apparently was not normal after that what do you mean not normal um I actually don't specifically know why I went to the school counselor because I think it was it was definitely one of those things that my parents decided to do um but I don't know I don't know why they decided to do that Probably because I was just, you know, a little ball of anxiety after that happened. And they're like, wow. I mean, they probably want to play safe, too, just to be, you know, I feel like that was a, that's a normal thing to do. Is especially it? Especially for a child. Is it a normal thing to do with your children? I mean. Not having any children? I have no idea. Anyway, <laughs> tangents. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't specifically remember the first time I experienced a death or really comprehended it. But I think, I mean, I think I just caught on from friends who experienced it or had a lot going on. And yeah, I mean, it's, I can't pinpoint one exact time, but going to a public school, you're sure to find some bit of death stories and, and life that can happen that can kind of freak you out. It's like, oh, a yeah. Kid. You're just showing up one day, you know, everything's sunshine and rainbows. And then, 
little Jimmy just drops some heavy news onto you and everybody's like, yikes. I just want to go recess, dude. I don't I don't know what that means, but are you still down for kickball later? Oh, or? man, maybe I was a little Jimmy who went went to school and was dropping some heavy, heavy truth bombs on my classmates, and they're like, man, you got to knock that off. You're just freaking everybody else out. Just go home and talk to your parents. Everybody's like the PTO to like meetings. Who's Lindsay? <laughs> well, we have a problem, <laughs> child. Um, can we get her into counseling? Because this is a That's little probably much. how you got into it. Your parents are like getting letters in the mail. <laughs> like, oh, yikes. <laughs> should probably deal with this now. <laughs> but, yeah, so was there, I mean, I think for me, kind of when I really started noticing it, specifically within school, I, so f- I don't remember when exactly, but I started just getting really nervous and anxious and I'd get these nervous tics and things like that that I would do, you know, rolling my eyes, breathing like kind of funny or sniffling or whatever. Um, and my parents kind of noticed it from a young age. And so, I mean, I ended up seeing a counselor for it. Um, I don't remember much from those visits. It was... I mean, I think, I don't know that they had a whole lot of resources there. And so I had to meet somewhere, I think every week or every two weeks. And I'd sit in front of a screen and I'd, I'd, uh, I don't even know what to call it. They didn't have FaceTime then, maybe not. I'd video call or video chat with the actual therapist. Man, we grew up in such different times. You're making me feel like a hella old. My my school did not have any computers of any kind. This is not. This wasn't at my school. <laughs> oh, okay. This was like side separate. Okay. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't even remember how it all worked, but I just remember it was recorded on there, and they'd ask me questions and stuff. But that's kind of the beginning stages in terms of what I like remembered of it at first, and then from there. I mean, I think it just kind of grew into knowing, okay, not necessarily something's wrong, but, like, for whatever reason I was acting this way or, like, in times where I'd get really excited or anxious or or nervous, it would really stand out and it'd be noticeable in public, you know, noticeable mm-hmm. in class and my teachers and things like that. And so I kind of almost had to hide it in public almost. And I think as a young kid, I was never really aware of the anxiety that it creates. But now, I mean, as I've grown older, just thinking back just on how as a kid, I mean, you don't you don't want people knowing those things about you, or you know, so kids in in elementary school say some mean things. Oh like, yeah, there's some bullies on the on the playground, and I don't know. I just didn't want to be a part of that, and so I just kind of kept it to myself and brushed it off, or always played it off cool if anybody mm-hmm. asked me a question about it. But I think that was definitely. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because I remember like not wanting my parents to know that I was like freaking out about them dying and like obsessing over it because like every night I'd like freak out like probably from second grade until the time I was like a sophomore in high school I would like freak out almost every night about this thought of like my parents not being around someday and like everybody close to me not being around someday and it just haunted me for years and I don't I mean, I don't know. My parents never really said anything about it. I never really had, like, a conversation with them about it. So I don't know if they ever knew. Um, But I always remember thinking, like, I don't want my parents to know because they have, like, their own stuff going on. And, like, as a kid, like, we, we grew up pretty poor and so like they had their own stuff. Like I knew that they were going through things and I didn't want to burden them with, like, my unnecessary fear of them dying because like 
you know, even that young, I understood. You're like, uh, that, you're like, fine, get over it. <laughs> yeah, like, that's not going to happen for quite some time, you know. But to you, that was like, But to me, mom. that was like, yeah. Come like, on. <laughs> those, are, those are the people who care for me. Like, yeah. what happens if I don't have them in my life, so. Yeah, nighttime um, was definitely not fun. I think that's when I really noticed it. I don't even know what it was. Like... Not necessarily afraid of the dark or anything like that, but just having to end that day and then, okay, see you in the morning or waiting till tomorrow to do something. You know, I didn't, I don't know if it was me not wanting to wait or just an accumulation of things, but it was always nighttime that was rough. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I had some of the worst OCD, which kind of led into like the nervous tics, you know, and, and those together. I was just a nervous wreck, you know, always tapping things and, and, and doing certain things. And, oh, man, nighttime was nighttime was a ritual. Let me tell you that. It was like something as simple as just getting ready for bed, you know, you're brushing your teeth. And then, I, you know, going and saying goodnight to your parents. I can't even count how many times I would tell my mom, like, all right, mom, good night. I love you. And, like, she'd clearly respond. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes she might be in and out of sleep or whatever, but she would respond, and I would, con like, I would repeat that, like, probably 20 times, 30 times a night. Mm -hmm. Just keep saying that. I don't know if it was, like, making sure she heard me or I was like, oh, well, well, what if she didn't? hear me this time or what if what if she didn't understand me this time and, and something happens and and then you know i never get to tell her that again or you know and same thing with me and my dad and uh, it was just not mm -hmm. not it was uh, it was a process and so we got to the point they're just like all right go to bed and i'm like <laughs> it's time to go to bed okay i love you you know and it's just <laughs> like oh getting back in that cycle again and it was oh i remember that like vividly yeah but those of you out there it's never a bad thing you know telling your parents you love them so many times as much as i get annoyed i'm sure they look back on that today and and really appreciate that but yeah it was yeah they just look back now and they rough. think oh what a little goober what a little goober you were yeah, and I mean, think I think in in those instances too. You know, you're going to bed, you're getting, you know, you're locking the door or shutting your door in your room or whatever. I would triple, quadruple. Oh, I checked that so many times. Oh, what if I didn't lock it all the way? Or I don't think I shut it all the way. Or just things like that that would just consume my mind. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I'm trying to fall asleep, and I'm like, just run, like my mind's going, and I'm like, okay, well, did I shut my door? I don't know. I can kind of see some light underneath. I, I'm just going to go check. And you kind of go up and check. Truth be told, everything's fine. Your door is shut. You know, but it was, yeah. just, it was just a repetitive process that I could not, like, get over for the longest time. Mm -hmm. I wonder if maybe it's so much more rampant at night because that's, like, the time that your brain takes to – kind of process everything that happened through the day and if you're not thinking about that particular thing throughout the day like you're distracted by other things but it's still lingering there in the, like the back of your mind all day and so you're just kind of suppressing it all day and then when nighttime rolls around it's kind of your brain's time to be like okay time to process this thing that you've been avoiding all day and that's when you kind of get into those weird weird head spaces yeah, so speaking of headspaces, so that was me even if I was home. And so now you can imagine when I'm not home and what that looked like. And so I think for me, one of the hardest parts with dealing with anxiety as a kid was going to visit family or going to stay in the night and sleepovers at friends' houses and being away from my parents. You know, they were the ones who understood my situation didn't mind that I was asking them a million times if I'm going to be okay or, you know, I love you, saying that a ton or, you know, is something going to happen tonight or am I going to be okay, mm -hmm. you know, kind of getting that reassurance. These thoughts would just run through my mind. Yeah, it was great hanging out with friends and I actually spent a lot of time over at friends' houses as much as I could, you know, which was good. But, mm -hmm. I mean, at, in the middle of the night, 
when my mind was racing, if I had any difficulties falling asleep or, you know, I didn't have a phone at that time mm-hmm. to, to shoot a text my my parents or kind of get that reassurance or comfort that I needed. So that was really a struggle for me just because if something happened or I needed help, I mean, the, the thought of disturbing my friends or their parents in the middle of the night was just like, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to be an... I don't want to impose on them. I don't want to be a burden on them. So it was just like little old me just sitting there awake, and I'm like, not, not okay. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you talk about that because I had a similar experience with mine because, like, here I am at somebody else's house having, like, a panic attack as a child freaking out that my parents are going to die while I'm not home. Like the whole So what did that look like? What did the panic attack look like for you? So moment? so mostly it was just like laying awake freaking out and thinking like, well I'm not home. What would what what about if something happened while I wasn't home? Like I I felt powerless, I guess. And and as a child you are basically powerless to do anything, right? Like there's what what could I do? If I had been home and something had happened, right? Like what? You can do whatever I, you put your mind to. <laughs> yes, beautiful little butterflies. Um, but like, what what would I have done if I had been home? But that was part of part of the thing. It was like, what if I wasn't home for whatever might have happened to my parents? Right. Or whatever would have happened to my brother or would have ever happened to my animals or whatever. And like that to me was one of my biggest fears of like not being there when my parents died or not being there when my brother died or whatever, you know. And so that was like a really hard thing for me to get over. And that was one of the main reasons why I had such a hard time going to sleepovers. Like there was one time I was at somebody's house and like, I was freaking out so bad. I had to like, I made up some excuse where I wasn't feeling good so I could have my parents come get me so I could go home. Like that is not healthy as a child. I should have probably been in counseling, but I'm not and I'm fine now. But um, yeah, not great. So that was after your little bits of counseling and... Oh, yeah. That was after my counseling in, like, second grade. Yeah. My my brain is broken. So you were worried about something happening to your family. And, I, I mean, I had those thoughts. But most of my thoughts were all internal for me mm-hmm. and, and my well-being. And, what you know, if something happened to me, mm-hmm. I would be helpless. I would be in a situation where... I didn't know what to do, and then, like, it was almost to the point where I couldn't even think about if something happened to my family or my parents, Um, but something that I've noticed, it's, that kind of came as I got older and understood more and realized all that could happen, Mm -hmm. and, you know, being the oldest of seven kids kind of carry that responsibility a little bit you know if something happens that that's on me so that Mm -hmm. didn't necessarily dawn on me as a kid you know and I can talk about that and we'll talk about that and how it's evolved you know into high school and into college you know later on but yeah I mean I think initially you know those overnights and things like that it was just all consumed I mean granted we you know we were up late (laughs) playing video games, doing what young little boys do and just, Mm -hmm. you know, avoiding homework and all that, you know, fun, boring stuff at all costs. And it was honestly, you know, some of those moments, even though I had a lot of anxiety, I mean, some of those moments are are, are some of the greatest childhood memories I have is spending those nights over with my friends and hanging out and, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's interesting to kind of look back and see how it was then. You know, and so, yeah, I mean, it's interesting for sure. Yeah, it's always interesting for me to kind of sit back and kind of think about how far I've come and all the things that I know now um, and just kind of realizing that that is probably exactly where my anxiety came from and it's just kind of followed me through my life. Um, And, I mean, I've gotten 
better at dealing with it. And I it's it's evolved over time to where the things that I worried about as a as a kid or worried about in high school aren't really the things that I worry about now, um, which I think is is fairly normal for for people to kind of have those things evolve. But um, for me to realize, especially especially when I got older, that like I've lived with anxiety my entire life has really been one of those things that has kind of changed my perspective about other people. Because if I went through that and then meeting you and knowing that you went through something similar, it kind of makes me wonder like how many other kids go through that. Um, and like as a parent, I'm sure that that's probably pretty stressful to be like, wow, my kid has anxiety. What do I do about that? Cause they're, what do they have to be anxious about? But that's one of those things that you just have to realize, like everybody is going through something at some point in their life. Um, and we should, well, all I think just... a lot of people don't even recognize it because childhood anxiety. I, I mean, I think it can manifest in many forms, mm -hmm. but I think too, is uh, like you said, children, obviously, you know, when looking at it, they don't have bills to pay. They don't have a family to support. You know, they just go to school, come home, mm -hmm. avoid their homework and go to bed, you know, and play video games mm -hmm. nowadays. And <laughs> But I think through that, at least from what I remember, is, I mean, I don't, being that young and dealing with all those things, I felt as if my friends didn't really understand what I was going through. It seemed like they had it all together or, you know, they didn't really have these struggles and stuff that I was dealing with as mm -hmm. much. Where now, obviously, you know, going through college and you're in such a vulnerable state and, <laughs> you know, you get to know people to a deeper level than ever before. But, I mean, you kind of just come together and, you like, I think part of the, the way it's evolved or how we've kind of come to terms with it a little bit is just knowing you're not alone. Kind of like how we said, mm -hmm. like, you know, I have it. I know you have it. Like, that's mm -hmm. great. You know, and we're talking about similar things. Yeah, exactly. When we and we grew like, up and we didn't even know each other, you know, and so yeah. like, things like that. And that's one of the that's one of the big things that I think people should recognize more is just that everybody's going through things. And, and if you feel like you're going through something that is unique to you. It, it is unique to you, but you might be able to just reach out to somebody and, and be able to connect with them because you don't really know what somebody has gone through in their life. Like even as a, even as a small kid going through like anxiety, some, some kind of anxiety at, at a smaller level than what adults might deal with. Um, but we can all maybe kind of, you know, understand where we're all, where we're all coming from. And just have empathy for each other. Yeah, and I mean, they say kids don't really have anxiety. They have stomach aches. And I was definitely one of those kids that had stomach aches all the time. And now, I mean, I don't know. I just, I never, like, understood it as a kid. You know, I just thought maybe I just, oh, conveniently, yeah, I don't really want to do that. You know, I'm just going to stay. Mm -hmm. Oh, stay I don't, I don't feel good now. Yeah. But now, now that I realize it, it's, it's so true. It's mm -hmm. like if there was ever a situation, like, like I said, like visiting with family or staying away from that comfort zone that you've established as a kid. <laughs> and then like, they're like, Oh, you want to come stay the night with us or, Things like that, I find myself just so nervous and anxious that I'm just like, oh, I don't, You're like, I don't no, really not feel really. that. You know, I just want to go <laughs> no. home. And so definitely one of those kids with the stomach aches yeah. and finding all those excuses not to do those things. But, yeah. So kind of transitioning into the future, kind of going, moving into the future, Um what you you talked about it evolving into high school what did that look like for you in high school so it really wasn't that it, it wasn't even that bad in high school like I got to the point where I felt like I didn't even have it anymore like I didn't have much of the nervous tics and I mean at that point I was not even really taking my medication anymore that they had me on when I was a kid to help with that but I I don't know. I didn't even recognize it. 
at that point. Like I don't like even through middle school, like it was kind of there, you know, maybe. But I, I was playing football. I was playing baseball. So seasonal sports year round, always doing something. And, and sports really helped me too. Playing baseball, just getting out there. Like you know, my mom would always tell me like you couldn't even tell that I had anxiety. Like I was a pitcher. I was a catcher, like all center of attention's focused on me. Mm -hmm. And in those moments of high, I mean, granted, it's, you know, Little League and not like anything super competitive or whatever, but, you know, through championships, games, or things like that, that to kids, I mean, it's exciting. And I was always so excited for it, like getting to go to my games and, and doing that was always something that I looked forward to. So getting through school, I was always looking forward to those games and, when I didn't have that, I was just like, oh, I don't know what to do. But I think mm -hmm. so through that going into middle school and even into high school, I was constantly playing sports, playing sports, playing sports. And so I don't know. I mean, if I got my bell rung a couple, t you know, too many times or if that just took away some of the anxiety, like some concussions <laughs> and stuff. But I didn't really like feel it at all in high school as much as I did when I was a kid. Yeah. But it was so weird. I, I mean, I was in, super involved in high school, doing a ton of different things. And yeah, I think the sports piece to it, kind of letting me release my energy and all that, those thoughts, emotions, and just exerting it into the passion for sports and, and competing was a way for me to release all that and not really have to not deal with it. I was dealing it that way by playing the sports and doing the best I can and focusing and putting all my energy in that. Mm -hmm. And that allowed me to kind of overcome that at that point in my life. Yeah, I don't, I mean, at the beginning of high school, I was still kind of dealing with my weird obsession with my family members dying. Um, but then as I got further into high school, I became so engrossed in academics. Um, my school didn't have sports, so I didn't prescribe to any of that um subscribe prescribe whatever um but with that i just became so engrossed with academics and i actually had a nervous breakdown my junior year of high school um my school only uh, only offered ap courses after junior year so you only could take ap courses um, and I tell you what, AP bio was literally the worst, worst experience of my high school career. I would stay up super, super late, didn't really sleep, was trying to just understand all this biology stuff and it was just not clicking with me. And there just came a point where I just lost it. I just could not do AP classes like that anymore. And, um, I had a nice cry about it um, and kind of talked to some of my friends and then just got back, got back into it and didn't really, I, I can't say that I didn't really like, I didn't really stop trying, but I tried less and I still had a fairly decent outcome for what I had. You know, I graduated with a decent GPA and gone to college and all that stuff, but um, How those AP courses treat you for uh, college <laughs> when you realize they don't mean anything? Oh, well, you know, funny thing. I showed up to the AP test and uh, slept through most of them. So, you know, there's that because that is harder than anything I have ever had to do in college. Easily, easily harder than anything I had to do in college. Um but that was that was really one of those things that I was I was so obsessed with school that I didn't really have time to to think about anything else that had previously caused me anxiety. And so I just kind of I, I can't really say like, quote unquote, got over it. But I did. I kind of like moved on from that and found something else to be anxious about, which is, you know, as life goes. All right. So as promised, every episode, we'd like to end with a quote that has resonated with us in some type of way. So today's quote comes from Renee Jane. She is a creator of the innovative Go Strengths and Go Zen, which are social and emotional learning programs for children with anxiety. 
She says, don't believe every worried thought you have. Worried thoughts are notoriously inaccurate. I think we found this really fitting as today's episode was primarily about our childhood anxiety and what that looked like. And so many nights were filled with those anxious thoughts, were filled with those worries and things that at the time were consuming every bit of our mind and our strength as we're trying to fall asleep at night or worrying about our parents or worrying about ourselves, what could happen. And, I mean, the quote says it. I mean, it's true. You know, those thoughts are notoriously inaccurate. The things that we worried about at that time, 10, 12, 13 years ago, weren't even, like, they never happened. And they were all just in our minds. And I think for me, even this quote now, I mean, looking, of course, looking back and, and seeing where I've come from and being a child, realizing that a lot of, a lot of my fears as a child were incredibly unfounded in reality. And it was just something that was occupying my time that wasn't worth my time. Um, but being who I am now and being an adult, I absolutely feel that this quote still resonates with me in that some of the things that I worry about now are still notoriously inaccurate. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but, um, it, it's just, it's a good thing to remember that not all of your anxious thoughts are going to actually have any kind of founding in reality. So if there was anything specifically that stood out to you from this quote, go ahead and uh, let us know. We'd love to hear it. Um, DM us on Instagram or Twitter at Frank Disconnect, or go ahead and email us at Frank Disconnect at gmail.com. Also, check out our website, FrankDisconnect.com, and go ahead and uh, give us a follow on Spotify. Thanks again for tuning in to this month's episode. We'll see you guys in a few weeks for another episode of The Disconnect.